Thank you all for joining us in person and online for today's event, the Department of Justice's role in combating nation state threats. I'm John Lipsy, the Director of Policy for the National Security Institute. For those joining us for the first time, the National Security Institute has both a policy and academic mission as part of the Scalia Law School at George Mason University. NSI is unique in that we draw on a bipartisan network of over 300 national security practitioners who have held senior positions in defense, foreign policy, intelligence, technology, and law, and who believe our national security depends on strong American leadership abroad, supported by vigorous defense and intelligence capabilities at home, while safeguarding our civil liberties. We are proud to have sent over a dozen of our experts to serve in the Trump and Biden administrations, including eight that were Senate confirmed. NSI is united behind a mission that we must dedicate ourselves to a, real, a realistic assessment of the threats facing the United States. If it wasn't clear before, it is now unmistakable that the threats we face today are profound. We saw it on unfiltered display over the last week. Revanchist, repressive authoritarianism consumed by grievances. It recalls the echoes of history, even as it extends its reach and influence through mastering the tools of the 21st century. Americans should continue debate to debate how to respond. But by remaining unflinching and identifying these threats to our values, to our competitiveness, to our allies, to our economic and national security, we have the opportunity to develop a foundation of common purpose, something to build on as we confront the challenges ahead. I'm proud of NSI's experts who have been at the forefront highlighting these threats and providing concrete, actionable solutions in a form that's tailored for policymakers. From the rise of digital authoritarianism to the risks of Huawei, to the nation state threat to the private sector, to foreign influence in our universities and our elections. And going forward, NSI will remain focused on the intersection of technology and national security, as well as on the threat of advancing global repression. In this spirit of identifying threats as they are, and in the moment of, in a moment of confrontation and deep concern for what lies ahead, we're honored to host Assistant Attorney General to the National Security Division of the Department of Justice, Matthew Olson. We look forward to expanding our understanding of the Department of Justice's approach to nation state threats. We'll begin today's event with remarks from AAG Olson, followed by a fireside chat before answering questions from the audience. For those joining us virtually, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function along the way. For those of us in person, please write your questions on a note card and an NSI staff member will collect them at the end of the remarks. Uh, we ask everyone to please include your name and affiliation with your question. Again, we're thrilled to have Assistant Attorney General Matt Olson join us today. He spent almost two decades at the Department of Justice serving in various roles, including in 2006, when he helped establish the National Security Division and serve as the first career Deputy Assistant Attorney General for National Security. He went on to guide the National Security Agency as its General Counsel before leading the National Counterterrorism Counter Center. And of course, in October 2021, he was confirmed as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. We are all eager to hear your remarks. Please welcome Assistant Attorney General Matt Olson. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate not only the introduction uh, in terms of my background, but also your comments on the state of the world today. With, I, I completely share your perspective. Um, I'm very appreciative and grateful to George Mason University, the National Security Institute, for uh, inviting me here today. Um, I was prepared to say that I was sad that Jamil Jaffer, uh, the head of the National Security Institute, wasn't going to be here, but I am very pleased to say that he is here with us today. Um, for you know, many of you who, who may not know, Jamil was in an accident recently, a, a scooter accident and, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, so um, for those of uh, Jamil, your friends and those who love you, we're really pleased to see that you're doing so well. So thanks uh, again, you look great. Um, you know, I, I've known Jamil for a long time. Uh, 
more than 15 years. We were together in the National Security Division when it was first started in 2006. And I have to tell you, I am so impressed with what Jamil, you and, and the rest of the NSI team have built here. Um, in just a few years, um, you have gained a well-deserved reputation for taking on hard problems and uh, tackling those problems and developing practical solutions. And this is something that's well known now, I think, in the broader national security community that you've done here at NSI. Um, and I believe, knowing Jamil, that what you have here at NSI really reflects uh, Jamil's determination and, and doggedness, uh, as well as his uh, commitment to our country's national security. So let me talk a little bit about, first of all, the National Security Division, uh, where I am privileged to be now. Uh, it was started, uh, as I said, more than 15 years ago, 2006. I was the senior career official responsible for the Department of Justice's intelligence work, really think FISA. Um, this past November, I then returned to the National Security Division as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. And it's remarkable for me to be back after that much time has passed and to see how NSD has grown over the years and all that it has achieved. And I am incredibly proud to be leading NSD and its very dedicated and, and committed workforce today. As many of you know, Congress created NSD in the wake of the September 11th attacks. Uh, the idea was to unify the different parts of the Department of Justice that focused on national security and to prioritize that work and then to promote cooperation more broadly between the Department of Justice and the intelligence community. Um, in the years since, it's founding again and again, the work of the NSD team has proven critical to our national security. In everything we do at the Department of Justice, and I'm gonna come back to this theme, our first priority is to adhere to the Constitution and to pursue equal justice under the law. And this mandate is really the North Star of our work. The division has a wide range of responsibilities. These include going after terrorists and spies. Um, that includes in cyberspace. We counter foreign malign influence. We enforce our export controls and sanctions laws. We review foreign in, uh, investment in United States companies. We also handle intelligence work and oversight. Now that includes FISA, as I mentioned, but it also includes providing advice on national security law and policies. And within each of these areas, NSD is at the forefront of efforts to use our legal authorities and tools to tackle evolving national security threats. When I was first at NSD, looking back with some reflection today, it's interesting you know, to think back that terrorism was our number one focus. You know, and that stayed true, at least for me, through my time, as John mentioned, when I was at NSA and then as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center from 2011 to 2014. Um, but today, as I now have seen firsthand during my first few months on the job, the overall threat landscape is much more complex. International terrorism, no doubt, remains uh, a significant concern, uh, but we also face an elevated threat from domestic terrorism, uh, who are motivated by a mix of ideologies. In cyberspace, we confront everything from profit-driven efforts to steal trade secrets and military technology to state-sponsored efforts in cyber targeting our critical infrastructure. Hostile foreign governments assault our democratic and economic institutions in pursuit of strategic competitive advantage. This is an, a threat that is different today than it was when I was in the government uh, five, six, seven years ago. These threats are dynamic. We and our partners at the FBI and the intelligence community have to be uh, both determined and agile to meet them. So today, I wanna to take a few minutes to specifically focus on the threats we face from hostile nations. We are launching a new strategy in the National Security Division called the Strategy for Countering Nation State Threats. Our goal with this strategy is to take a comprehensive approach. Uh, it's gonna draw on the full power of our tools and authorities to address the alarming rise in illegal activity from hostile nations. And this includes growing threats within the United States to Americans, as well as threats to Americans and, 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 our, and US interests abroad. We see nations such as China, Russia, Iran, North Korea becoming more aggressive and more capable in their nefarious activity than ever before. These nations seek to undermine our core democratic economic and scientific institutions, and they employ a growing range of tactics to advance their interests and to harm the United States. Defending American institutions and values 
against these threats is a national security priority, and it's a priority for the Department of Justice. So this new strategy is threat driven. Uh, we are going to prioritize NSD's work and the use of our tools, and we're going to allocate our resources to address these threats head on while at the same time preserving the flexibility that we need to counter these threats effectively. And we're deploying this strategy to focus on those areas where I believe the Department of Justice can have the most impact in combating the greatest threats to our national security. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about in terms of these threats, starting with transnational repression. In recent years, we have seen a rise in efforts by authoritarian regimes to interfere with freedom of expression and punish dissidents abroad. And these acts of repression cross national borders, often reaching into the United States. We have pursued, for example, agents of the Chinese government who have tried to coerce American citizens and residents to comply with China's repressive and extra legal orders. For example, we charged PRC government officials for taking part in what's called Operation Fox Hunt, an illegal multi-year campaign to coerce the return of Chinese nationals to China. And what we've alleged in the indictment represents a direct affront to the rule of law, human rights, and American sovereignty. Instead of cooperating with the approval and coordination of our government, PRC officials traveled to the United States, directed PRC operatives to violate US law. This scheme included, for example, threatening one victim's daughter over social media, even bringing his elderly father from China to the United States to warn that the victim's family in China could be harmed if the victim did not return. We've charged nine people in relation to Operation Fox Hunt, including for acting as illegal agents of the PRC government and for interstate and international stalking. In just last month, we charged four senior officials of the government of Belarus. We alleged that they conspired to use a false bomb threat to force a plane to divert and to land. The plane was carrying four American citizens, and the purpose of the forced uh, landing of the plane was to arrest a prominent Belarusian dissident. And last summer, we charged four Iranian intelligence agents for conspiring to kidnap a US-based journalist and human rights activist who was speaking out against Iran's repressive laws and practices. So this sort of oppressive behavior is antithetical to our values as Americans. People from all over the world are drawn to the United States to the promise of living in a free and open society, one that adheres to the rule of law. And to ensure that this promise remains reality, we have to continue to use all of our tools to block authoritarian regimes from engaging in this type of activity. They seek to extend their tactics of repression beyond their borders into the United States. So that's one example. Another, foreign malign influence. We have to defend the integrity of American political discourse by expo exposing foreign malign influence campaigns. Our laws demand that foreign governments and agents be transparent about their efforts to influence the American public and insist that they represent those parts of our electoral processes that are reserved to Americans alone. I should say insist that they respect those parts of our electoral processes that are reserved to Americans alone. In recent years, DOJ has exposed and prosecuted covert influence efforts undertaken on behalf of the governments of Russia, China, Malaysia, Pakistan, to name a few. And at the same time, we're strengthening the civil and administrative provisions of the Foreign Agents Registration Act. The failure of, of hostile nation states to respect national boundaries and basic legal norms is even more stark in the cyber realm. We continue to see costly interference with critical infrastructure and public service systems, supply chains, and private businesses. And we also confront campaigns of theft of sensitive information, ransomware attacks, and digital extortion. So some examples. Last year, the PRC government engaged in a malicious cyber uh, campaign using vulnerabilities in the Microsoft Exchange server. I know this is familiar to many of you. This, this campaign targeted thousands of victims around the world. Russia's solar wind attack similarly compromised tens of thousands of networks globally, including those of US, state, federal, uh, local governments. Iranian government actors have interfered with systems of a broad range of victims in critical, critical infrastructure sectors. And then North Korean government actors have robbed cryptocurrency exchanges and central banks alike, stealing hundreds of millions of dollars and evading international sanctions designed to limit their weapon systems, uh, limit their weapons programs. Our role at DOJ is to seek to identify and disrupt cyber threats to national security and hold these malicious actors accountable. Finally, of course, we remain vigilant against core national security threats like traditional espionage activities and efforts to evade export control and sanction laws. It's essential that we thwart attempts to unlawfully obtain classified information relating to our national defense, 
weapons systems and sensitive technologies and research. We have to continue to hold rogue actors accountable for malign activities and work with like-minded partners around the world to deter and impose consequences on those who flout the rule of law. So, as you can see uh, from these examples, we at the Justice Department confront uh, threats from a variety of nation state actors. Our, our new strategy reflects this reality. There is no one threat that is unique to a single adversary. But at the same time, it's also clear to me that the government of China stands apart. So I wanna address how the department's approach to Chinese government activity fits within our overall more broad strategy. As the FBI director publicly noted a few weeks ago, the threats from the PRC government are more brazen and more damaging than ever before. He is absolutely right. The PRC government threatens our security through its concerted use of espionage, theft of trade secrets, malicious cyber activity, transnational repression, and other tactics to advance its interests against ours. To be clear, when I talk about this threat, we are focused on the actions of the PRC government, the Chinese Communist Party, and their agents, not the Chinese people or those of Chinese descent. And as we talk about the threats that the PRC government poses to the United States, it is critical that we never lose sight of that fundamental distinction. We must always be vigilant to ensure that no one is treated differently based on race, ethnicity, familial ties, or national origin, and this is a foundational commitment of the Department of Justice. Let me give you a few examples with that distinction in mind of what the PRC government is doing. First, it has targeted US citizens with connections to the intelligence community in order to obtain valuable government and military secrets. In recent years, we have prosecuted four espionage cases involving the PRC that reflect a concerted effort to steal our most sensitive information. Next, the government of China has also used espionage tools and tactics against US companies uh, and American workers to steal critical and emerging technologies. Again, agents of the PRC government have been caught stealing everything from cutting edge semiconductor technology to actual seeds that have been deployed for pharmaceutical uses after years of research in this country and the investment of millions of dollars. Uh, third, the PRC government has used malicious and unlawful cyber campaigns uh, to pursue technological advancement and profit. The PRC government reaps the benefits of these criminal activities while the victims, including governments, businesses, and critical infrastructure operators lose billions of dollars in intellectual property, proprietary information, ransom payments, and mitigation efforts. And then finally, as I've mentioned, the government of China has gone to great lengths to silence dissent. It has intimidated journalists, employed a variety of means to attempt to censor and punish US citizens, residents, and companies for exercising their rights to free expression. I mentioned earlier Operation Fox Hunt, which is just one example. So it's against this backdrop uh, that the department announced the China Initiative in 2018. And the idea behind the China Initiative was to develop a coherent approach to the challenges posed by the PRC. And the initiative effectively focused attention on the multifaceted threat from the government of China. But this initiative has also engendered growing concerns that we have to take seriously. So I wanna take the opportunity today to discuss our approach to nation state threats overall and to also address the China Initiative directly. We have heard concerns from the civil rights community that the China Initiative has fueled a narrative of intolerance and bias. To many, that narrative suggests that the Justice Department treats people from China or of Chinese descent differently. The rise in anti-Asian anti hate crime and hate incidents only serves to heighten these concerns. And the department is keenly aware of this threat and is enhancing its efforts to combat, combat acts of hate. These efforts are reflected in the Attorney General's memorandum last year following the enactment of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. There are also increasing concerns from the academic and scientific community about the department's pursuit of certain research grant fraud cases. And I'm gonna talk about those specifically. We have heard that those prosecutions and the public narrative around those cases can lead to a chilling atmosphere for scientists and scholars that damages the scientific enterprise in the United States. Safeguarding the integrity and transparency of research institutions is a matter of national security, but so is ensuring that we continue to attract the very best and the very brightest researchers and scholars to our country from around the world. And that we continue to honor the tradition in this country of academic openness and collaboration. So in light of all of these concerns, when I began a review 
back in, in, in November when I first took office. It was to hear from folks about these concerns. The, the purpose of this review that we started in November of last year was forward looking. The key question was whether this framework was still the best way to address the strategic needs and priorities of the Justice Department. And while I remain focused on the evolving significant threat that China poses, I have concluded that this initiative is not the right approach. And instead, the current threat landscape demands a broader approach. So I want to emphasize my belief that the department's actions over the past few years have been driven by genuine national security concerns. But by grouping cases under the China Initiative rubric, we helped give rise to a harmful perception that the Department of Justice applies a lower standard to its investigation and prosecution of criminal conduct related to that country, or that we in some way view people with racial, ethnic, or familial ties to China differently. I began my career at the Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division. I know that the department is committed to protecting the civil rights of everyone in our country. But this erosion of trust in the department can impair our national security. It alienates us from the people we serve, including the very communities the PRC often targets as victims. Our reputation around the world for being a country dedicated to civil rights and to the rule of law is one of our greatest strengths. So as part of this review, I've paid particular attention, as I mentioned, to cases involving academic integrity and research security. When it comes to these cases going forward, the National Security Division will take an active supervisory role in these investigations and prosecutions. In evaluating these cases, NSD will work with the FBI and other investigative agencies to assess the evidence of intent and materiality present in those cases, as well as any nexus to national or economic security. These considerations will guide our decisions, including whether criminal prosecution is warranted or whether civil or administrative remedies are more appropriate. In addition, recently the White House Office of Science and Technology released new guidance to federal funding agencies that include procedures to correct inaccurate or incomplete prior disclosures about connections. These agencies have prior res primary responsibility for research integrity and security where individuals voluntarily correct prior material omissions and resolve related administrative inquiries, this will counsel against a criminal prosecution in accordance with longstanding Department of Justice principles of prosecutorial discretion. So make no mistake, we will be relentless in defending our country from China. The department will continue to prioritize and aggressively counter the actions of the PRC government that harm our people and our institutions. But our review convinced us that a new approach is needed to tackle the most severe threats from a range of hostile nation state actors. So going forward, the National Security Division will pursue this work guided by our strategy for countering nation state threats. Our recent experience confronting the very threats posed by the Chinese government has shown that a multifaceted challenge demands an integrated and multifaceted response. We need to expand our approach to these threats by recognizing that the capabilities of each hostile nation and the full spectrum of activity each country undertakes to achieve its goals. And we must align our capabilities, our tools, and our resources with those across the federal government to meet and counter these threats. So our work will be guided by three strategic imperatives. First, we must continue to defend core national security interests and protect our most sensitive information and resources. We are going to continue to aggressively investigate and prosecute espionage, export control, and sanctions violations, and any interference with our critical infrastructure. Second, we're going to protect our economic security and prosperity, including key technologies, private information about Americans, supply chains, and industry. We will bring all of our tools to bear on this challenge, including the regulatory authorities that we have uh, as part of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States and Team Telecom, as well as criminal process when appropriate, to prevent and mitigate harms from economic espionage, hostile manipulation, and cyber-related malicious activity. And then third, we must continue to defend our democratic institutions and values to ensure that the promise of freedom in the United States remains a reality in the face, and it's poignant to say this today, in the face of rising authoritarianism. 
We remain steadfast in our commitment to preventing malign influence inside our borders and to promoting freedom of expression and democracy against corrupt and repressive regimes. As we move forward, the department remains committed to confronting any nation, any nation that threatens US national security, economic security, or our democratic institutions and freedoms. So we will use all of these legal tools in our arsenal, our arsenal to combat these threats. The cornerstone of our work at the Justice Department is to investigate and prosecute crimes uh, sponsored by hostile governments and their agents. This includes prosecuting state agents for espionage, hacking campaigns uh, against our government or the private sector, and the repression of critics, as well as efforts to manipulate the public discourse within the United States. But in, in addition to our criminal enforcement work, we will also use our civil and administrative tools to mitigate threats from foreign investment activity and foreign interests that seek to secretly influence public opinion in the United States. We will also support broader whole of government efforts, which include, of course, diplomatic engagement, the use of economic tools, resilience building in communities within the United States and abroad to address these threats. And we will reach out along with our partners in the federal government to build trust with affected communities to understand their public safety needs and to ensure they feel comfortable reporting crimes. Finally, we will continue to engage with democratic allies to share information and to discuss how together we can make our partner countries more secure. Again, together we will develop strategies for effectively responding to these grave threats to the law and to our economic integrity. So in conclusion, uh, the United States is a beacon for people all over the world who seek to live in an open and democratic society. And it's our duty to protect the United States from the myriad threats we face while staying true to the Constitution and to the values of the Justice Department. I know that this commitment, this commitment to securing equal justice while defending our national security is one that's shared by everyone in the National Security Division and across the Department of Justice. So with that, uh, again, my thanks to, to John and Jamil and to NSI uh, and to you all for being here and, and listening uh, to me this afternoon, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. All right, John, questions. So, um, folks, uh, just a reminder for the audience to please um, uh, get your uh, question cards and questions from online. Uh, to the NSI team, and uh, we will get to those uh, shortly after after a short chat uh, uh, that I'm going to lead here with Matt. Um, so let's start with the China Initiative. Um, we're uh, here hosted at a uh, um, at an academic institution, a university, George Mason University. Um, you know, at NSI, uh, uh, Jamil and we uh, make it a point not to be overly concerned or overly impressed with what we call sort of boxology solutions where right. you know boxes on the org chart are moved around and things are uh, appear to be prioritized or, or not um, so you know um, I appreciate your remarks we want to do both right we want to um, ensure that uh, uh, we have um, integrity in our in our uh, federal funding uh, programs and at our research institutions um, uh, we also want to uh, maintain sort of the benefits of having open, you know, these open cultures uh, um, that attract, become uh, a pull of gravity uh, to the United States for the best and brightest around the world. So, um, but let's talk about the threat from the CCP. You, you outlined um, an array of activity. It's multi multifaceted. Um, the director of the FBI, um, you know, uh, just recently, again, uh, reiterated that, uh, you know, I'll quote him, uh, there's just no country that presents a broader threat to our ideas, our innovation, and our economic security than China. Uh, he's opening two counterintelligence cases a day. Um, you know, uh, estimates range to up, upwards of $600 billion in theft of right. uh, intellectual property um, from the United States. Um, the list goes on. Um, as you did your review of the China Initiative, um, understanding that you know one of the outcomes is to, to tailor uh, criminal prosecutions uh, to a degree, what did you learn about uh, the scale and nature of the threat that's unique and particular and, and, and most challenging about with China? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's 
certainly as I started this review, the first place I went was to the FBI to talk to our partners there, and particularly in uh, the counterintelligence division, but across the FBI and to the intelligence community to try to, to, to understand better the threat that we face. And, uh, you know, that's one of the lessons I learned from being at the National Counterterrorism Center for three years as the director is that everything we do has to be driven by the threat. And that's the starting point for any strategy, any approach. Um, I, I have been, uh, you know, I have been struck, as I, as I said in my remarks, by the level of threat we face from a range of nation states, but that certainly does include China. And I know that exactly that the, you know, I read the FBI director's speech where he talks about uh, that, you know, China, no government poses a broader, more severe threat to our ideas, innovation, and economic security. And I, I totally agree with his uh, assessment of the threat from China. And it, it, one of the aspects of the Chinese, the threat from the Chinese government, uh, from the PRC government is that it's a concerted one. It, so there's sort of a multifaceted aspect to it where it combines in a, you know, I think probably a, a long term strategy to look at ways to outcompete us technologically, militarily, and economically. And they pose a threat to us across a number of vectors, economic espionage, theft of trade secrets, uh, uh, cyber, malicious cyber activity. So I think I have, you know, I, as I've worked through this strategy, there's no doubt that China poses a significant threat in the way the director of the FBI describes. And that's why I'm so committed to being relentless to protect our country from that threat. So how do you, you know, losing the moniker, how do you continue to demonstrate that um, this uh, threat, which the, the most significant threat remains the most significant uh, priority um, within NSD, within the broader DOJ, uh, the signal you're sending to, to the FBI and law enforcement, um, the signal you're sending to um, uh, universities, uh, research institutions, and the like, in terms of um, uh, the continued diligence that needs and the continued priority that needs to be um, applied to, uh, you know, to the to the scale and and, and threat uh, posed by the CCP. I mean, the, I think that it's important when we talk about the threat, and this is why I again harken back to my time at the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, you know, I, there's no doubt that that China is a significant threat actor, particularly in the realm of countering our economic prosperity. But I don't think that it's wise or you know is good strategy to focus on one country, uh, particularly when we're talking about you know, the level of nation state activity that I've seen, again, from Iran, North Korea, and of course, as again, as we sit here today, Russia. Uh, and so the question I've had, I've asked as our team and, and, and as I've conducted this review is, you know, how do we make sure that we are aligning our priorities? And I'm sending, as you said, John, the signal to uh, the National Security Division, to the U.S. Attorney's offices, to investigators at the FBI, to the intelligence community, um, about what we are prioritizing and how we're working with them to make sure that we're looking at all the tools that we have, certainly criminal prosecution, but other tools to combat that array of threats. And, and it was, you know, it, it struck me that it's, they're focusing on the China initiative didn't make sense anymore in the context of the, the, of the array of, of threats we face, again, from a broad range of, of state actors. Yeah, fair enough. And, and we're going to um, we're going to uh, broaden this out a bit. I'll, I'm just going to um, harass you for one more minute here. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, that you just mentioned is, is um, perhaps unique uh, or at least um, uh, the scale is unique uh, when it comes to China is uh, the focus on economic security, um, uh, the attempts to acquire um, by hook or crook, um, you know, technology, uh, um, uh, you know, scientific discovery, you know, what have you. Um, and the China Initiative, one of the things that it, it did highlight is some of the areas where, you know, we have some, you know, soft underbelly, if you will, at, you know, the um, uh, research and academic institutions that, um, you know, treasure values of openness, of um, cooperation, glo you know, global cooperation and the pursuit of scientific discovery and the like. Um, uh, you know, we saw from the White House um, uh, recently guidance about how we might, you know, sort of improve 
disclosure around conflicts of interest and conflicts of commitment and the like. Um, but we haven't, it seems, yet gotten to the point where we have started to rethink um, uh, or to at least review whether we should be rethinking. Um, uh, do we need to put in place new guardrails to any extent on some of the research, uh, uh, some of the research that, that we are funding uh, currently in a much more open way? Um, you know, a, a recent um, bipartisan report from the Senate um, after an a investigation uh, recommended that we should be reconsidering these things. Is, is that something that, um, that you're thinking about, that the administration is, is considering? Are there um, certain guardrails we should consider around talent programs or, or other matters? So, I mean, let me, the way I think about that question is, is it's, there's no doubt that what the Chinese government has done is to exploit our openness. Um, you know, one of our greatest strengths is our open democratic system, but it also presents opportunities for a nefarious actor like the PRC to try to exploit that for their own benefit. And certainly sitting here at George Mason University, uh, this university, like every university, like all of the funding agencies like NASA and the National Science Foundation, that you all are entitled to know when you um, sponsor research or fund research, that you're doing so in a way that's free of conflicts of interest. And I am not taking that tool off the table. Um, when we find cases uh, where uh, somebody is fraudulently, you know, covertly uh, uh, has a conflict of interest, um, that's a, and, and we can show that and we have evidence of intent and materiality um, and and when we look at any connection to national security or economic security, we're going to continue to bring those cases. I, I am, though, concerned, and we have had cases that have not turned out well for the Justice Department, and I am aware that some of those cases and some of the work in this area has engendered uh, the perception that we have a different uh, standard, a lower standard for people who are uh, ethnically Chinese or have some connection to China, and that is you know, absolutely unacceptable. And I, we need to address that because it undermines our efforts. It's wrong, and we need to take steps to address that as well. So um, what I think we need to do is bring those cases that are strong uh, in, this, in, this, in this context. Also, though, look for other uh, avenues to address uh, wrongdoing or, or to establish accountability through civil and administrative penalties. I do think the White House's work will help facilitate some of that because it will help clarify the rules in this area. And in any event, this is not the most significant aspect of the work we're doing to counter Chinese uh, you know, nefarious activity. Uh, it is that's really the focus there for the National Security Division is on economic espionage and theft of trade secrets and the like. So let's talk about that a bit. Um, uh, in addition to um, your career in, uh, uh, in government, you also um, uh, more recently um, uh, served at, um, uh, in the private sector, uh, helping to found a uh, cybersecurity uh, firm and otherwise. What did you learn about um, the threat that um, uh, the private sector is facing on a daily basis from uh, the myriad of nation state actors? Um, we, uh, uh, you know, the, the private sector is having to wage, <laughs> you know, a defensive campaign against nation states on a daily basis. Um, much of the, many of them are very much outgunned, outmanned. Um, there are, you know, uh, continue to be limitations on uh, what um, the U.S. government does uh, to support them. Um, talk about what you uh, saw and experienced um, now that you've been on both sides and what more can we do um, uh, rather than uh, maybe taking individual cases and plugging individual leaks, um, but at a more systemic level to uh, really change the game when it comes to supporting the private sector? So I think this is such a great question, and, and I know NSI has done work in, on, on this, this issue, or this set of issues, really, this challenge. And, and I, when I think about this, I, again, I draw, my own, draw on my own experience, um, having been the general counsel at NSA, so I got to see firsthand uh, what NSA's capabilities are and some of NSA's um, you know, intelligence collection, so I know about it, this question from the perspective of an intelligence agency. I also think about this question uh, from my time at the National Counterterrorism Center, where, you know, if you think about the, 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 the way in which the, UN, the United States, our allies, confront terrorism threats, uh, 
It is a whole of government response. It's a coherent response. It's not, it is one where the government feels, you know, completely responsible for responding to terrorists. Right. Um, and then you contrast that with uh, what we all can see in terms of the cyber threat. Uh, again, I saw, and I saw the cyber threat, both having worked uh, in a small company uh, that was building software to protect companies, but also my last job was in a technology company where um, I oversaw the team that handled, uh, we called it engineering security, but it was cyber security and the, and the chief information security officer. So, and it was a big team, it was a team of 200 people uh, devoted to that in, in, a, uh, in a technology company. So I feel like I've seen this from several different sides. Uh, um, so this is a long warm up to try to figure out how to answer the hard problem that you pose. But I mean, the, the, the difference between terrorism and, and, and cyber is so much of the threats we face in, in with respect to malicious cyber activity really fall on the shoulders of the private sector. And the government um, plays a role that is not, to my view, you know, uh, has not been sufficient to protect, those, protect the private sector, particularly critical infrastructure. And we haven't really figured out how to do that holistically in the way I think we do when it comes to terrorism. So I think there's a lot of good, good energy around this, a lot of good ideas. Uh, you know, bringing, sharing information obviously is always, a, is always one way to think about this. Um, certainly I think for my role today, you know, as I've sort of stepped out of my lane and answering that question, I think going back into the National Security Division, we have a critical role to play in terms of uh, uh, you know, investigating and prosecuting and calling out malicious cyber actors, and I think that's a big part of it. We also support the FBI and its efforts to reach out to industry as well as Homeland Security, which obviously has a significant role here. I, I just feel like this kind of holistic government effort with the Justice Department, the intelligence community, the Homeland Security, you know, working together seamlessly, you know, we're getting there, uh, but that's an area that I think we continue to focus. It seems there are some parallels perhaps between um, the private sector, uh, as you talked about, uh, um, being in on, uh, to a degree on its own and defending themselves. Um, with uh, you know what we were talking about before, with universities and research institutions essentially being left responsible to right. try to conduct due diligence against you know sophisticated intelligence operations um, by nation state adversaries. But um, let's um, let's move to you talked about um, the transnational uh, sort of threat um, that uh, is increased seems to be increasing. Um, uh, this is a um, this sort of expanding global repression is is an area that's going to be a focus for NSI this year. Um, I'd love to hear you know more of your thoughts on that. You know, what tools? So there are a number of different aspects of this, and some of it you, you know, fall easily and squarely into um, you know potential criminal you know prosecution. Um, some of what we think about, and we have a lot of national debate around. Um, in terms of you know uh, self censorship um, uh, um, among our uh, among our private sector uh, and our universities, the economic leverage that um, that uh, you know kind of stifles um, you know people's feeling of freedom to to speak and to dissent against uh, uh, what the CCP uh, is doing at home and abroad. Um, how do you think about these different aspects of the transnational threat? What are the aspects that are core to what NSD and the Justice Department can go after? What tools do you have um, to address them? How do you address something like um, the CCP's willingness to use to coerce um, people through uh, essentially taking family members hostage right. and the like? What, help fill in some gaps. Yeah, I mean, I think this, I, I'm pleased to hear that NSI is going to be focusing on this challenge of transnational repression, I think it's a significant, uh, a significant challenge for our country. Again, you know, we our greatest strength is our openness, um, and our, our, our democratic institutions, our our universities. Uh, but it, these can also pose, you know, vulnerabilities for us. And not that that should change the way, you know, our values, but it, it's just a reality that that China, uh, but also other governments, um, seek to exploit and. So I think when it comes to the tools that we have in the Justice Department, it's primarily investigation and prosecution because often these types of repressive activities violate U.S. laws, U.S. criminal laws. Um, we have four cases uh, where we have charged the agents of, uh, of, of, 
uh, four different cases, one involving you know, the, the PRC, one involving Egypt, one involving uh, uh, Belarus, one involving um, Iran, all you know, with this theme of transnational repression, some within our borders, some outside of our borders. Uh, so the primary tool and, and set of authorities we have are criminal prosecution, but I do think part of it uh, is also for us to work with the FBI, which has close relationships with institutions, including universities, to you know, br br bring attention to this challenge. Uh, in some ways, it's a matter of education. Uh, where these challenges are, are most prominent. I think the university community is a, a primary one. Um, but then again, sort of work that, that they, uh, you know, civil society organizations like NSI do, again, to draw attention to this. Because, again, I've been struck since I have returned to government for, in, over the past four months how much activity there is in this area. And it's absolutely antithetical to our values um, of openness and free expression as Americans. And that's why I think it's so important that we focus on it. So I'm going to try to squeeze in two more, and then uh, we'll go to the audience questions. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, within the context of the nation state threat that you're talking about, I think, I think it's fair to say that one of the um, uh, more utilized or powerful components um, or tools that they're bringing to bear is actually the use of non-state actors mm -hmm. right and sometimes it's um you know uh, uh an alignment of uh objectives sometimes it's more coordinated and directed right. sometimes it's um you know uh, uh just a convergence of opportunity and um and the like how do you think about um addressing uh these non-state actors criminal organizations ransomware groups you know uh um, terrorist groups etc um, within the nation state context and the nation, this new st the strategy that you'll be deploying, um, how do they fit within that? How do we know? How do we, um, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean anything that they are, that this coordination is happening? How do we think about harboring? You know, how do you think through the issue yeah. about the use of non state actors? I mean, it's a great question. Again, I, I do think it's a, it, it's a particular challenge in the context of malicious cyber activity. Where you know it's it's not uncommon for uh, non-state actors to be tolerated or or you know have some relation to uh, the nation state itself, uh, and so I think for us, if, and given our tools in the Justice Department, again by investigating and prosecuting these individuals, um, we can we can identify and attribute their connection to nation states, and even where it's not apparent. Or maybe we are not able to make it apparent. The, the the act of prosecution does shine a light on their nefarious activities, uh, and again, I think we've learned a lot in the counterterrorism realm on how to uh, use our federal uh, prosecution authorities, use federal courts to go after non-state actors effectively. Certainly in that context, and I think we can draw some lessons from that. So, last question: um, We have uh, Russia beginning an invasion uh, of Ukraine, um, the United States, uh, the UK, the EU, Japan, um, and others are um, initiating a range of sanctions in response. Um, I think we all anticipate an escalation on both fronts um, as we go forward here. Uh, we've had a lot of debate um, and discussion uh, in this country around um, you know, uh, what our response should be. Uh, how we should respond. I don't know that we've surfaced enough conversation around what we should anticipate in response uh, um, from Russia to our, um, you know, to the uh, the penalties we seek to impose for uh, for their aggression. So, how you know how are you and the administration um, uh, preparing for that? Thinking through what the different levers are that Russia may be prepared to uh, to pull. Um, uh, what should you know? What should we anticipate? What should the American people anticipate? Um, what is uh, National Security Division's role in uh, preparing and responding to that? Yeah, again, John, I appreciate the question. And I appreciate your remarks at the opening of our session today. I mean, certainly any conversation today about national security has to begin with, um, as you did, uh, recognition of the crisis in Ukraine and, and, and a, I think an appreciation for how dangerous the situation is and the people uh, in that part of the world who are in harm's way. 
Um, for our part, the Justice Department, you know, we're working along with, with the rest of the, the government to prepare for any possibility. Um, I know that the president has raised a concern uh, uh, around the possibility of, of cyber attacks, um, that, uh, and that's an area, obviously, of focus for us along with, with others. Um, I think the, the United States government has made it clear uh, that if Russia launches any sort of disruptive cyber attack against our companies or our critical infrastructures, that we're going to be prepared to respond. Um, again, for our part, we have significant role to play within the Justice Department uh, in terms of our ability to support a whole of government response, and that includes working with the FBI um, and with uh, other federal partners uh, to respond as, as we would need to. And this is you know, I can assure uh, folks here today that this has been something that we are working around the clock on. Jessica, over to you. All right, is this live? Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for their questions. Uh, just following on what you just briefly spoke on, you spoke extensively about partnerships with the interagency and partner nations and allies, which is critical. Can you describe how you see that moving forward a bit more, as well as um, NSD's partnerships with private and civil society sector organizations? Jessica, I'm very sorry. That's the very beginning of the question I didn't catch. Uh, yes, you spoke extensively about partnerships with interagencies and partner nations and allies. Can you explore that a little bit more, as well as with private uh, civil society sector organizations? Yeah, uh, and, you know, this is such a, a gr an important point that we often People think about the Justice Department. I'm up here as a, as a Justice Department official talking, but we are you know, integral to a, a, broad, uh, role, a broad national security community. Um, you know, just a very concrete example is the participation of the Justice Department in the National Security Council decision-making process, uh, which is uh, basically happening you know, constantly, particularly in the context of the crisis in Ukraine, but on a range of issues, on a range of issues. And so, uh, and again, I think my experience in the counterterrorism uh, context really showed me the power of those relationships. I, I used to say, if, any, if folks in the American public could see uh, decision-making uh, within the National Security Council and by the national security community, they'd be very proud to see uh, how, one, uh, expertise, how much expertise there is, how apolitical it is, and so those partnerships and that the power that can that can um, that they can engender uh, when people work together in that way when when departments and agencies bring to bear the, the range of authorities it's it's just really impressive and it's critical to our success but that doesn't it doesn't stop there it's, it, it it extends to civil society certainly extends to our uh, allies around the world uh, and again, in the in the current crisis, you can be uh, confident that those conversations are happening, not just in Washington, but around the world. Thank you. Another question. Reports indicated that you had listening sessions with members of Congress before today. What are some of the things that you heard in those sessions? Yeah, so, and as I mentioned, I started this review shortly after taking office in November of last year. And one of the most important features of that review for me was to understand uh, you know, both the nature of the threats that we face, that's, as I said, anything we're going to do has to be based on the threat. But it was also to understand the criticisms that were, that, that were being made about the China initiative. Um, and those criticisms came from a number of different quarters. Uh, they certainly came from uh, members of Congress who I met with. Um, but, it, but in particular, uh, it came from the scientific and academic community, as well as from uh, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. And so um, I had the opportunity to meet with, you know, just m many, many different groups and to hear uh, about those concerns, which I talked about in, in, my, in my remarks, but just to be a bit concise, you know, this concern that we had lower standards for people with ties to China uh, in terms of our prosecutorial decision-making and that we were chilling uh, from the scientific community, chilling our ability to attract the best and brightest to study or, or, or do research in the United States. What I will tell you is that in the course of my review, I never saw any indication, none, uh, that any decision that the Justice Department made was based on bias uh, or prejudice of any kind. Uh, I was, you know, this was a concern that I understand 
uh, and I and I appreciate that perception, but I didn't see that in any of the cases or any of the decisions that were made. Again, though, what's important to understand is that the mere perception of that type of bias undermines our efforts, and uh, and it makes it harder for us to um, in, you know earn the trust of the communities that we are trying to serve. So, you know, I think that's probably the best way to answer that question. Great, and this is somewhat tied to what you just stated. Um, you know, you've stated making clear academic integrity cases will be pursued if it meets intent, materiality, national security thresholds. What does this mean for pending cases? Is is your investigation is that the review, or is there going to be additional review? So we've you know we've continued to um, pursue the cases that have been pending. We've reviewed those like we do every case. We consistently review. I am comfortable. Although I'm not going to talk and can't talk about specifics uh, in any of these cases, I am comfortable uh, with the, the, with those cases as they stand and their continued pursuit. Wonderful. Um, we've heard a lot about private sector um, and, and dealing with cyber threats. You've talked a little bit about how, you know, whole of government approach. What can the private sector do? What can Silicon Valley do to assist DOJ and other agencies in protecting cutting edge technology? Yeah, so that's another really, you know, that's a, a huge topic. I, uh, you know, how can the government and the <laughs> private sector uh, work together to protect uh, emerging technologies and critical technologies? I think, um, again, having worked both in a technology company and within the intelligence community, the Department of Justice, I do think that we uh, have an opportunity to continue to work more closely together uh, with uh, technology companies to make sure they understand the nature of this threat, just information and education, um, so they understand the nature of this threat. Uh, we have to continue to build trust between these two communities. That trust has been uh, harmed over the past decade, and I think that that, let, that trust is critical so that we uh, are willing to share information with each other, trust, uh, find each other credible when we bring information to each other. I do think that uh, that you know, for the Justice Department's side, you know, we we can you know cases that we might bring, investigations we might bring, we need to be able to work with the uh, these technology companies to understand where they face threats and where um, where we can be supportive. And I think that's you know the perfect example is in the cyber realm, uh, understanding when companies face cyber threats. Some of it's helping them understand the nature of the threat so that they can better protect themselves and defend their networks and their data. And in other cases, it's just being in a position to uh, hold nefarious actors accountable. But, you know, again, I've worked on both sides of this issue, and I really feel that there, the opportunity to be more um, collaborative is in front of us, and it depends on building trust. Great. And then we got a lot on, along the lines of, we have talking about a new approach for DOJ. Is this the official end to the China Initiative? Yeah, to be clear, we are uh, no longer going to have a China initiative. That means there won't be a website, although it will still be available uh, in the archives, but we are not having a China initiative going forward. Again, um, having listened to the concerns uh, and more, most importantly, also having understood the nature of the threat we face today, I think a better strategy, a more appropriate, more effective strategy is to uh, is to look at all of the threats we face from nation state actors and to build our strategy and to send the, the demand signal to our partners, to the U.S. Attorney's offices, to the FBI, to focus on all of these threats uh, from hostile nation states as a, uh, across the board and to learn and to focus on how we can use the tools and authorities that we have at the Justice Department to combat these threats. Great. One last one. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the evolution of DOJ's approach to naming and shaming of foreign government affiliated or sponsored cyber actors and what you're seeing, if anything, in terms of reciprocation or retaliation? So we bring cases when we find violations of the criminal law that we can prove. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, we ultimately charge defendants. We hope that we will be able to bring them to the United States and into an open court uh, in our country and prosecute those and bring our charges forward in that context. Where we don't, where the, the indictment speaks for itself and, and we speak through our charging documents, um, that can have an impact as well. Um, so I, I think we need to continue to, again, do what we do best at the Justice Department, and that is to follow the facts, apply the law, 
uh, and, 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 and bring evidence to bear where we have violations of the criminal law. And in some cases, that means we'll have people in courtrooms in the United States. In other cases, that may be uh, not happening in the near term, but we have, uh, we have long memories at the Justice Department and the FBI, and we'll continue to pursue the people we charge to bring them to justice. I hope you'll give me, forgive me some quick marketing. So um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, please be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at Mason Natsek. Um, please uh, check out our podcast, Fault Lines and Iron Butterfly. And uh, please tune into uh, some upcoming uh, events. We have the first with Anya Manuel, moderated by Nick Schifrin on March 22nd, that explores China's push to become the next technology leader. And then our next Natsec nightcap event uh, with Secretary Mike Pompeo on May 26th. Uh, thank you for joining us, for being thank here. You. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.